Policy Impacts of Empirical Research. This session is organized by the EEA Standing Committee of Research. And uh, one of the goals of the EEA Standing Committee on Research is uh, to uh, boost uh, the impact of, uh, on uh, empirical research on, in Europe that has come from the availability of administrative record data in many countries. So uh, our aim is to collect information on data access in, uh, this, uh, in different countries to administrative data and also to provide some best practices about uh, um, data dealing with data confidentiality issues and also uh, with the replicability of research. Another issue that is coming up with a, a great body and uh, of excellent empirical research we have available in Europe is that we have still issues uh, with uh, relating this uh, research to the general public. On the one hand side, uh, to making the public aware of uh, the research that exists and what our results are saying. And the even more challenging issue is uh, to translate this uh, research output into, uh, into ac actual policies. Uh, so to also speak to policy makers and make policy makers aware how they can shape uh, policies based on this research. So our aim is to collect examples of good uh, empirical research that uh, translated into policy effects and also to make uh, people aware of the challenges. So what is the misinterpretation we get in our research uh, from the policy makers or from the media and how we can deal with it. So this session tries to uh, start the first impulse in this direction with giving you uh, three presentations on very policy relevant uh, issues. One of them is migration, uh, funding of higher education and taxation. So we have three excellent speakers uh, who will give you short presentations of their research and in the end we will have uh, some discussion. We have some time constraints because Christian Dustmann has to leave early so he won't be available for the discussion and this is also why we wanted to start on time. So thank you very much for coming and uh, we'll start with Christian's presentation. Okay, um, well, yes, I thought it starts at 12, but it starts at 1, so I have a flight and I have to uh, leave early, therefore I um, kind of start off this session. Um, now, I would like to talk about migration politics and the media, and the way I have organized my talk today is I first want to make some more general remarks uh, of how I see um, working on topics which have a very high visibility in the public domain and then I would like to talk about three pieces uh, of work we have done uh, which uh, received a lot of media attention uh, to, uh, well, as kind of case studies uh, of some of the problems and issues uh, involved with that uh, which I will point out in the first part of my presentation. Um, so uh, why would you do research uh, on migration. Now, migration is interesting because there were actually two reasons for it. The first reason is it is important in its own right. Migration has been uh, a really big uh, issue uh, in terms of economic relevance over the last 20 years. National as well as uh, international migrations have dramatically increased uh, and it speaks to many subjects of relevance. Economic development, innovation, uh, economic growth, climate change, etc. So there is a lot of interesting work to do on migration. So one objective of academic work would be to analyze economically relevant questions. However, the big visibility in the public and policy debate uh, actually creates uh, a second reason why we may want to work on migration. Important for the policy debate, migration is a highly political issue is used as a means to pursue political goals uh, by many uh, political actors and this of course challenges uh, academics to shed light on misguided uh, debate. So another reason why we may want to work on migration is actually to respond directly to the policy debate and a lot of work can be actually uh, well uh, um, uh, uh, categorized into those two uh, categories. Um, what are the opportunities and what are the pitfalls when we engage with a highly politicized subject? Well, the opportunities, clearly it may be easy to motivate your research. Uh, given the public attention uh, the subject has, 
It is easy to get attention for research that speaks to popular topics, uh, and it may be easier uh, to get funding. However, there are also pitfalls. Uh, well, the subject may attract substandard research, which is uh, bad for the entire field. Uh, following current political hypes, uh, which many, in particular, young researchers do, may not result in good and sustainable research agendas. Uh, and there is a danger uh, to get burned by being assigned to a particular political camp. So something we always have to be very wary about when we work on something which is politically very visible. So how should we choose research topics when working on highly politicized subjects? Well, I would think it's very important to carefully follow the debate. The research topic has to be relevant but it also has to be academically important and feasible. Uh, and it has to have, in my view, a very clear potential to be publishable in a top uh, economics uh, journal. So we shouldn't choose topics no one cares about anymore in two or three years' time. And that, of course, with migration, is a particular danger because there are particular areas of public interest which really uh, are very dominant a particular point in time, but they go away very quickly. By the time you have finished your research, well, nobody may actually care about them anymore. And most important, one should not choose a topic everyone talks about, but where the data is very weak uh, and where any ambitious research project cannot be concluded. So no matter how topical something is, if you don't have the data, if you don't have the possibilities to conduct good research, I think you shouldn't touch it. Um, now let me give you some examples uh, of research that we have done and received a lot of attention and from which I at least learned a lot uh, for how to deal uh, with uh, well research which uh, is politically uh, very visible and the mistakes we actually uh, made. Um, in 2003, we were asked by the Home Office to produce a report that predicts the impact of EU enlargement on May 1st, 2004 on immigration to the UK. Uh, the report which we delivered at the end of 2003 discussed various scenarios based on the best data available at the time but it warns at many places that any numbers provided should be interpreted with great care. So it was conducted in the way you would conduct such a report as an academic. It predicts an average annual increase in net immigration from A8 countries over a 10 years period of around 13,000 under the assumption that Germany and other EU countries would also allow for free movement of labor. So we delivered that report at the end of 2003. Now, from that moment onwards, uh, we were completely taken by surprise about the huge interest that report received uh, in the public domain. It attracted a huge media interest uh, with all attention focused on nothing else than the 13,000 number. The report had uh, more than 100 pages, but nobody, well, I think nobody actually read it. Uh, we were heavily attacked in the years after the report came out as our predictions seemed too low. Give you some examples. Uh, the then conservative shadow minister, Lord Howell of Guildford, described the predictions in 2005 as being laughably out by about 2,200%. The then Liberal Democrat spokesman, Chris Hume, claimed in 2008 that the breathtaking scale of misprediction was 1,373%. And Jack Straw, who was Foreign Secretary at the time of accession, said that the predictions were completely catastrophic. I mean, they were wrong by a factor of 10. Well, what, what happened? What went wrong here? Um, there were three types of error made in the debate which followed the report. The first one was there was confusion of annual figures with cumulative ones over 9 to 10 years. So the first citation I showed you uh, was making, among others, that particular mistake. Secondly, there was confusion of gross numbers and net numbers. A gross number is those coming to the UK, and net number is the difference between those who come and those who leave. Our numbers were net numbers. 
the interpretation many commentators took were gross numbers. And that is a difference one, one to three, uh, according to the, uh, to the ONS. Now, the biggest mistake was a total disregard for the context to which the predictions were supposed to apply and the reality of the context in which actual post-accession flows occurred. So the Home Office commissioned their report with forecasts for the case in which other EU member states would also permit labor migration from the A8 countries in the event all other EU, EU member states, except for Ireland and Sweden, put controls on labor migration in place. So no forecasts were commissioned or calculated for that case. By the time the report was actually in the public domain, those numbers were actually not applicable anymore. Now, when we allowed, and we had scenarios in the support, in the report, when we allowed for diverted migration flows from Germany, which we assumed, and rightly so, to absorb the largest inflow from the A8 countries, uh, well, the range of possible inflows to the UK suggested is actually quite close to what actually uh, occurred. So, what do we learn from that? Well, the huge public interest in the report and the public uh, political nature of the subject completely hit us by surprise we realized that any subtleties, such as net gross, get completely lost in a highly politicized, non-academic debate. And we should be aware of that when we engage in such a debate. The validity of predictions, not only uh, a particular situation, Germany opens up as well, seem to be of little interest to commentators on both sides of the debate. And to just give you an idea, uh, well, what was the political purpose of that report? David Blunkett, who was Home Secretary at the time in a 2017 BBC documentary about Labour's 2004 decision to allow for free movement of Labour, uh, said, I was quite prepared to use the cover of the statistician's analysis. So the report uh, served a particular political function, which we, of course, uh, quite naively were unaware about at the particular point in time, but I think we should be aware about uh, as academics when we engage uh, in any such debates. Now, let me give you another example. In 2014, we conducted analysis uh, of the fiscal impact uh, of immigration. The reason was that after 2010, when the Conservative government started, uh, well, uh, pretty uh, well, um, developed austerity politic uh, in uh, the UK, there were dramatic claims made about the negative fiscal impact immigration had to the UK. They were supported by queues in the NHS, by public services not becoming available, uh, by uh, teachers uh, not being able to spend enough time on native children, uh, etc. So we decided to look at the data to see whether such claims were actually uh, justified that resulted in two research papers which were press released and distributed on the 5th of November 2013 and the 5th of November 2014. Uh, the key finding uh, was that immigrants, and in particular those who were arriving from the EU, made actually completely contrary to what uh, many uh, commentators suggested, a large net fiscal contribution. Um, that work had significant media coverage. The results were mentioned uh, in, uh, well, we, even, we just counted some of them, uh, and we counted more than 250 times uh, in, uh, uh, in newspapers and featured in more than 50 TV or radio contributions. It made sustained impact on the public discourse with media continuing to find our findings all the way through the end of 2018, and the research guided Parliament's legislative agenda featured in debates in both the Lords and the Commons and was cited by third parties in their own submission of Parliament. Now, let's kind of lean back and uh, what we made of that. Well, this time we were far better prepared for the response to our research. We made sure that the analysis was as transparent as possible and we foresaw many of the reactions we did not foresee uh, the first time. Uh, the impact on the policy debate, well, we would like to believe that to some extent our work helped limiting the level of outrageousness uh, in the debate about the fiscal impact of EU migration to the UK, which we actually 
uh, had seen before we started that work. Uh, and academically, uh, well, we believe uh, methodology, well, it was, it was worthwhile to do. The methodology was replicated in similar analysis, uh, and the pop, uh, paper published uh, well and uh, was highly cited. So from our view, uh, something which was important to do and which was also uh, quite uh, successful. A third example uh, was work which was commissioned by the Low Pay Commission uh, in 2005, and we were asked to prepare a report that investigates the impact migration has on wages around the minimum wage. Uh, it was challenging as none of the existing methodologies actually allowed to look at the impact of migration along the distribution of wages, which was precisely uh, what uh, we did uh, in that uh, particular uh, work. The findings were, interestingly, that immigration held wages uh, back below the 15th percentile of the wage distribution, but it led to an increase of wages further up the distribution uh, due to complementarities. Uh, with an overall positive effect. And again, the uh, report uh, did uh, get a lot of uh, media, uh, um, media attention. Very interesting is the impact on the policy debate, because this time we produced something which had something for everybody. Uh, there are small negative effects at the bottom of the distribution. Uh, please also look for evidence for harmful effects of migration, and they are still uh, cited uh, by uh, such commentators, the positive effects, please those who would like migration to have positive labor market consequences. So it became pretty clear uh, uh, something I will, I will kind of comment on uh, a little bit later. The academic impact, well, the particular request by the Low Pay Commission uh, kind of incentivized us to uh, develop a new and important methodology which was replicated many times. Uh, and I think that's always one of the very positive things which come out of requests uh, from, uh, well, public actors uh, in order to do research uh, for which maybe methodology doesn't exist, but there are existing questions which require such methodology. So uh, let me kind of come back to uh, what this whole section uh, started off with in the description uh, I read about that. So how influential is empirical research in economics for policy decisions? Well, I think, first of all, we need to be aware that there are different objectives. Academics are usually uh, striving for finding answers to particular questions and to address these in the best and cleanest possible way. Policymakers, however, think about policies and politics. So the objectives are completely different. Uh, secondly, uh, policymakers consider output of economists, I would think, as a shelf from which they choose uh, what serves their objectives best. We should always be aware of that. We are producing output which is shelving uh, those uh, supply. Nevertheless, what we can actually do is to stock those shelves with reliable uh, and significantly and scientifically sound evidence, uh, and uh, that clearly uh, is uh, a big contribution. <coughs> Secondly, uh, we can provide evidence to policymakers and the public that allows for an informed debate uh, and uh, uncover uh, false uh, arguments. And I think this is what we should all uh, strive for, and more importantly, uh, today uh, than uh, ever. Coming back to one of the objectives of uh, this entire exercise, in order to do that empirically, we need the best data available. Uh, so anybody who is responsible for uh, data provision uh, should understand the big responsibility those institutes, those institutions, and those actors have uh, for the policy debate by allowing us to analyze such data uh, and to produce evidence uh, which uh, addresses uh, those two uh, objectives. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Gazala Asmat, talking about uh, funding of higher education.
Okay, so thank you very much, Andrea, and the EEA Standing Committee um, for the invitation to be part of uh, this session. So higher education funding is today one of the most important and uh, highly debated public policies. And we've seen huge amounts of expansion in recent years internationally in terms of participation into tertiary education. We've also seen big increases in the amounts of, uh, spent on higher education, both publicly and privately. But when we look across countries, there's a, there's a lot of variation in terms of how higher education is financed. So if we look at one end of the spectrum, you have, for example, the Nordic countries, which are typically characterized as countries where you have no tuition fees and actually very generous uh, financial support. You also then, if you look at many of the European countries, you see that there are actually more modest uh, tuition fees, but also... You also see um, very small amounts of uh, financial support. Then you look at the other end of the spectrum. So if you look, for example, at the US and also parts of uh, the UK, we see sort of high tuition fees. And often, there can also be uh, generous financial support. But many countries are actually in the process of at least thinking about reforms in the way higher education is being funded. So in that sense, it's actually interesting to look at the UK case. Because within the UK, there's been a, a great deal of change in recent years. So before 1998, it was a country in which we had, uh, in England and Wales, we had uh, higher education being uh, free of charge. Then through three major reforms, this shift is in terms of the, the, um, the amount of uh, the costs going towards parents and, and students. And there were four sort of main components within this. So there were the tuition fees and also the loans associated to these fees, but also maintenance grants and uh, maintenance loans. So with respect to the tuition fees, starting in 1998 with the first reform, these were actually relatively modest, in where, whereby they were means-tested £1,000 a year. So it was only families who, ha who were um, sort of high-earning families which were paying this amount per year. But this changed in 2006, and in 2006 what you find is that um, all students, irrespective of their household income, are required to pay 3,000 per year. In 2012, this shoots up to 9,000 a year. Now, at the same time, the, since 2006, all students have access to loans of the, the amounts uh, of these tuition fees. So this is coming from the student loan company, in which, uh, which is a non-for-profit, government-backed um, organization. And these loans are income contingent. So these loans, um, they're not payable until students are earning above a certain threshold. So under the 2006 reform, this was around 15,000. And in the 2012, this was 21,000. Also, these loans get written off after some time. So after 30 years of, um, of, of having this loan, they are either written off uh, if none of it is being repaid or, or partially uh, written off. Now, so on the other side, so looking at um, the progressivity side, there were sort of changes with respect to um, shifting, uh, so shifting some, having some increases in uh, the form of grants and also reducing the financial uh, constraints in the form of, of loans as well. So with respect to uh, grants, what we see is that there was changes um, whereby there were uh, means-tested grants before 98. This got eliminated, they got reintroduced. But the major sort of changes happened as well in 2006, where families on, uh, low, um, with low household income were eligible to um, grants of up to around 2,700 per year, which when you think about the tuition fees at that time, which were 3,000, it means that the net amount payable was actually relatively small. These sorts of grants increased again in 2012, um, but not to the same extent as what was happening with the tuition fees. <coughs> Combined with this, there were also available means-tested loans, and universities were instructed to use uh, some of the money that they were receiving in the form of fees to offer additional grants to students from low-income households. But one thing I think is important to mention is that since 2016, these means-tested uh, grants have actually been abolished, and they've been replaced by an increase in the amounts of loans available to students. 
It's something I'm going to come back to a little later. But going back again to thinking about the share of higher education costs covered by public expenditure, you can see here that, um, as I remarked at the start, you have, for example, the Nordic countries, which are characterized as being countries in which you have very high and, and traditionally high and continuously high uh, coverage by public uh, expenditure. Then on the other extreme, you have the US, which, is, which has a low um, coverage by public expenditure. But the interesting case is the UK, because in the UK, you see that this expenditure, the direct uh, expenditure on higher education um, from with public expenditure, decreased from 80% to around 25% in a relatively short period of time. And, and this wasn't without controversy. In fact, there was a, a, a lot of attention going to the fact that England seemed to be the highest um, university tuition fees in the industrialized world, even when you compared it to, for example, the state universities of the US as well. Now, the, the sort of feeling with all of this is that since it's moving to a more fee-based uh, system, that there may be sort of um, concerns about the impact that this may have on, uh, on students from lower-income uh, households where they don't have the capacity to pay for these sorts of fees. But, of course, I mean, in conjunction with these fees, there were also changes with respect to, to the amount of uh, means-tested support that was provided. So it makes, in a sense, the effect of these reforms quite unclear. Now, what's been going on more recently? So recently, with respect to these reforms, there's been a great deal of um, political and policy discussion about what to do about this, re the, the, uh, about this system. And what you have actually uh, continuously since the introduction of, uh, of this, um, these financing reforms is uh, proposals to reverse the system completely. So to scrap tuition fees, um, th this being sort of the, the sort of proposals by the um, opposition parties. So the Lib Dems in 2010 had it as part of their manifesto. Even more recently in 2017, the Labour Party manifesto was proposing to abolish tuition fees and also to reintroduce the, the maintenance grants. Beyond sort of the idea of scrapping the system and reverting back to the old system, there's been kind of a lot of discussion on changing and reforming the system in other ways. So potentially going from the traditional three-year program that we see to a two-year program, um, which would mean potentially lower overall cost for the students, but it may also suggest that you're changing the rates per year as well. Very recently, as in the last year, there's been a, 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 a sort of a, a large um, report which has talked about other potential ways in which uh, the system can be reformed. And, and one of the proposals was actually to change the way in which um, fund, sorry, in the way in which um, students are charged depending on what program they enrolled in. So this could be because of the costs associated with teaching some of those degree programs, or it could be um, because of the expected returns that the students would have in these different programs. So for instance, a student who is enrolled in something like English or history would see potentially a reduction in their tuition fees uh, to about 6,500, but someone enrolled in medicine or in a STEM subject would, see it ha would have to pay double that, so go up to around 13, 14,000 per year. So all of this has still been controversial as well, and there's been a number of other sorts of proposals with this too, so reducing fees for all, um, actually extending the amount that, of time that the students have for the repayment, so going from 30 to 40 years, to sort of combat the potential of there being a lot of default among the students, uh, changing the rate of interest, for instance, as well on the, on the loans that they're taking out. But of course, I mean, going to what the topic of today is, well, what does economic research uh, and empirical research say on the impacts of these reforms? And this has been the, the, the subject of a paper I'm working on with uh, Stefania Simeon, in which we ask two main questions. So we're asking, did these higher education reforms affect student outcomes? And also, was there a differential effect across different socioeconomic groups? And we're looking at this in a comprehensive way. So 
rather than simply look at enrollment effects, we're looking at the sort of decisions that students may make conditional on enrollment. So this may be their, their location decisions, uh, the university choices, or the field of study. And we also look at their sort of, um, their, their, um, the, the effects that there may be in the labor market later as well. And we do this using detailed administrative data, which allows us to track students who are um, in state schools, which is around 95% of all the students in, in, in England, um, to evaluate the two major reforms, so the 2006 and the 2012 reform. And, and the data here is key. And, uh, and going back to what Christian was saying as well, I mean, here, um, access to data in which we're able to link um, different sources and, and, and have it so that we're tracking students over a long time allows us to ask and answer some of these questions. So in particular, we're using uh, the National Pupil Database, which tracks students from around the age of seven and follows them through um, school until they've completed high school. And it, we're then able to link this to data within university. So it allows us to see, for instance, the types of subjects that they're, they're studying, uh, also their behavior in university, if they're switching behavior, their dropout behavior. And then we are also able to link this same data to, to survey data in which we can, uh, we can track the students at least in a sort of, in a short run after they've left um, ed higher education and into the labor market. So in terms of the way in which we're looking at this, we're comparing, we're identifying the effect by comparing students uh, from different cohorts who are, who are um, subject to the different uh, reforms and the different higher education funding uh, policies. And we do this by matching students, not just within schools, but also within neighborhoods. So you can have neighbor, many neighborhoods within a given school. So it allows a sort of detailed match across different students. And, and we complement this by looking at um, comparisons with sort of neighboring Scotland, where they, they, they continue to have free higher education, so comparing England to, to Scotland. So what do we find? So overall, actually what we find is very modest effects. So looking overall at the enrollment effect of the 2006 reform, what we find is that there is a very small effect on participation of less than 1%. And, and what's interesting about the result is that when you look at the effect across different SES groups, it's largely born on those from the higher SES groups and having sort of negligible effects on the, the lower SES groups. So sort of suggesting that these sorts of reform, that this reform actually led to a decline in the um, participation um, gap between high and low SES groups. Now, when we uh, then take this and do some weighted analysis in which we're trying to understand the effects of the different components, because these, fin these fundings were not just sort of tuition fees, they were bundles with the maintenance grants as well. So trying to understand um, the, the, the effects of the changes of these different uh, components, what we find is that there does seem to be an offsetting effect between the different components. And I think in a sense, the, the, the sort of changes in the maintenance grants are an important sort of element for helping to close or, or being an important sort of uh, measure to close these enrollment gaps um, between the um, high and low SDS students. Now, summarizing the results, when we look at not just enrollment, but look at the other dimensions and look at the other sort of uh, margins, we see very similar sort of modest effects. So there are sort of overall very small effects on these margins, like where students are going to university or the fields of study. Across SES group, there are some small differences across the, the groups, but generally these are small. And when we look at the 2012 reform, similarly, we see very small effects, even given the extent of the change in tuition fees around, um, around this reform. We can only look at, given our sort of data, we can only look at the, the more short run, um, but the, the results seem to be suggesting the same, um, the same outcome. Now, within the study, we, we explore a number of potential mechanisms to explain why there are these sorts of uh, 
why there are these results, how are they, they're interacting with one another. But for the last couple of minutes um, that I have, what I'd like to do is just um, sort of wrap up in terms of thinking about what the overall findings of the, the study are and also what the implications kind of may be for, for future reforms. And I think what we're sort of showing is that these funding reforms had actually relatively modest effects uh, on uh, participation. Um, and they were, they were mostly concentrated on those who were in unconstrained families, financially unconstrained families, or they were not eligible for support. Um, and, and it was this bundle of uh, the reform, so the, the maintenance grants together with the tuition fees, that sort of at least reduced the, uh, the, the, the negative impact that the fees could have on the lower SES groups. And I think this kind of points to a sort of important point, which is that if you think about sort of access to finance and, the, you know, the, this was an important part of what was going on within these reforms as well, the access to, um, to, to, to loans. It seems that, I mean, governments will have easier access to finance than uh, <coughs> students from lower income households. So it sort of makes sense to go in this direction. They are also more sort of uh, governments are, have better technologies and systems in place in which they can sort of um, claim back the repayments, but perhaps through, through taxation. So sort of lessons for the, the sort of future with respect to these types of policies. In a sense, it seems that one, the main sort of objective of these types of reforms was to sort of reduce the uh, burden of higher education funding uh, to shift the burden to some extent, while keeping to a minimum the sort of potential negative effects they might have and the, the, um, the implications on, on, in, in, on equality too. And to some extent, it seems to have, have succeeded in that. But when we're looking at kind of the potential reforms going forward, it's important, and, and, and some of the reforms that have taken place quite recently, it's, in, it's important to see that it's, it's still a matter of a bundle and a package and changing one without sort of um, changing others or changing them differently is going to have a sort of important implication. And I think that takes me to, in a sense, my last um, so slide, which tries to emphasize, I think, the fact that these these reforms are affecting more than just one margin, and this is something that we need to take into account. But beyond that, it's that the, the, the bundle that we see, so the effect of, for example, the abolition of maintenance grants is probably not without uh, implications. Even if we're increasing or reducing uh, tuition <coughs> fees as have been proposed, it's the, it's the bundle that needs to be considered. So policymakers should be sort of taking into account not partially or, or bits of recommendation, but to take into account the, 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 the effect that, there's, that we'll see kind of um, for the policy all around. And I think this is, is particularly important in the case of what we've seen with respect to the reforms in the UK because of the potential long-term implications of things like holding debt. So especially since the abolition of the, the grants in the UK, which have been replaced by um, still uh, offering sort of uh, finance through the form of grants to low-income students, but these loans have to be repaid at some point. And in a sense, we still don't know very well what the implications will be and whether there's heterogeneity across different individuals from different, um, different, uh, fr from different uh, uh, backgrounds in terms of the repayment of uh, these loans. Um, and, and quite likely, especially given uh, the, the recent changes, the, the holding debt is going to be higher among um, students from for, poorer families than it is from richer families. So all of these things need to be taken um, together. Research speaker is Klaus Kreiner talking about the economics of taxation. Okay, <clears throat> so thank you much, very much for the, uh, the invitation. Um, when uh, Andrea invited me, she uh, wrote as a motivation for, uh, for this session 
that I realized that it's not easy to find examples of empirical research with real policy implications. And that got me sort of uh, a little thinking, why is that? And you know, is it actually the case that what we do does not have any policy impact? And you can say, you know, why should they have access to all this register data, right? Because it does not, you know, they have fun, but it does not change society in the end. So uh, I'm going to try here to make two points, and I'm going to back it up with empirical evidence, two observations, two examples. Uh, so the first point is that I think we have few studies where we can sort of say, here from this study, we got this direct policy implication out of that. And I think that's because that policy impact does not often not align with academic impact. I'm going to give you an example from my own research uh, on that. Now, that may, of course, sound like a, a bad case. But my second point is, actually, I think empirical research, I consider that's at least the case in Denmark, have a lot of effect on practical policy making. But the thing is that many studies that we have are basically indirectly influencing policy. It's not that this particular study gave this change to policy. But in fact, I think what is going on here is much more important than uh, the example that I have up here. So let me turn to the first example. So uh, this is from a research project that I did uh, with colleagues and together with the Danish tax authorities. Uh, it on, involved 40,000 randomly selected individuals. It was a huge uh, randomized experiment. Uh, the, uh, the academic uh, paper is published in Econometrica. And I also made sort of a, a policy piece. And it went also, as you can see, to the front page of, of one of the Danish uh, newspapers. So, if I should just give you sort of a very, very brief an example of the results in this paper that gives you the main takeaway. Then here it is. So if you look at, on average on the net income of people in Denmark, then the evasion rate is actually pretty low, around 2%. If you look across different inc income components, then on personal income, that's basically your wage earnings, also a little uh, other stuff. In Denmark, it's only 1%. But if you look at stock income, that is capital gains, capital losses, dividends, is very high, it's 5%. If you look at self-employment income, it's crazy, it's 16%. And you can think about why that is. If you move down here and say, okay, information reporting becomes less and less. So what we did was basically to take uh, people's tax return and then divide all the items into third-party report items and self-reported items. And when you did that, what is striking is basically that the Danish tax authorities, they know 95% of income in society from third-party reporting, basically. And what about the evasion rate on that? 0.3%. Why? Well, that's not hard to figure out, right? So if you try to evade on that, the Danish tax afford to have a computer say, go directly to jail, right? <laughs> right, they know it. The rest, the 5% is something that you had to self-report on your tax return. And on that, the evasion rate was actually pretty high, 40%. So all self-reported income people were supposed to self-report. Very high evasion rate. So what, are, what was sort of the impact of this study? Well, first, it had a direct policy impact. So the consequence of this study, the policymakers in Denmark decided to introduce full third-party reporting on stop income, implying that all financial institutions had to report dividends, buying prices, and selling prices on stocks. And that implies today the tax authorities are computing your total tax liability because we have a se separate tax schedules on stock income. So it's basically prepared on, on your tax return. It's fantastic for those who have this because they don't have to compute anything. It is a disaster for all those who evaded before because it's now very difficult to evade, of course. <laughs> um, now, that was a direct impact of the study, but the academic impact of this study was somewhat different. The main question we were going for is, why is all tax evasion so low? Is it because people are unwilling to cheat or is it because they're unable to cheat? So a hypothesis is basically people are unwilling because they have good tax morale, social norms, you're a very nice guy, right? <laughs> Another one is saying you're unable to cheat because of information, that uh, they have, you have all this information of the tax authorities. And what, this baby, what, what we basically did here was to show that actually the good old theory that we had from 72 that people said were wrong is actually pretty good. You should just account for third party information and, and extend the model with that. Then that model seems to be actually a pretty good picture of what is going on in reality. So now the main point here is basically to know that policy impact and academic impact does not really go hand in hand here. If I have made a study saying, oh, you should know, 
in Denmark, we have a high evasion on stock income. And we could maybe figure out on how to do something about it here in Denmark. Then probably, I don't think the editors in the metric have to think that was a sort of ah, something they would publish, actually, right? So there's this tendency now in, you could say this, for us, this was a side effect of this study. But for the tax authorities, this was a side effect of the story because they were going after that one. So this was a good example why collaboration actually get hand, got hand in hand. But just think this is so rare. Normally, we are going for academic impact, policy impact, and that is also what we should do. You know, we should have good policy makers doing practical analysis using our methods on register data inside the ministries, for example. So that's the reason I think we don't have so many papers that have a direct policy impact. Now let me turn to the second example. That's about the concept of elasticity of taxable income. This is probably the most important parameter of the Minister of Finance. And note, this parameter is basically important in order because it measures behavioral responses to people's tax changes. So if we raise taxes, then people are trying to escape, they work less, or they do tax avoidance. Instead of getting money payout, you will get it as free benefits, and you have companies that do fitness inside the company, and all kind of fancy stuff going on. Everything is basically capturing the activity of taxable income. So that's a key, key parameter for redistribution in the society and also for the level of public expenditure because it goes in in the, the computation of cost-benefit analysis inside the Ministry of Finance. And the Ministry of Finance in Denmark, their view is based, they run the right parameter. They're not politically biased and you have, you have clear division between the policymakers and what is going on inside the Ministry of Finance. They do all the policy report for, the, uh, for the, all the politicians, but they do the computation with this key parameter, for example. And think now of um, the top market tax rate in Denmark, for example. It is, the effective rate is 66% in Denmark, one of the highest in the world. Uh, this simple formula will be now basically tell you that if you take this tax and you want an extra revenue of, say, 10 billion kroner, you raise the tax rate to get 10 billion Danish kroner, then this loss is basically saying, well, you're going to have behavioral effects, so you're going to lose some of this revenue. And here, the loss, for example, is 60%. So this is saying 10 million, but then people change behavior, then you lose out 6 million, and then you get a net revenue of 4 million. That's, of course, important for the Ministry of Finance to know because they want finances inside the Ministry of Finance. Now, this is just the formula. This is the effective tax rate. This alpha parameter is saying something about the concentration, about the uh, about this threshold where the tax rate kicks in. And in Denmark, it's very, very concentrated uh, around the threshold. So that parameter is very high in Denmark. Now, the ETI, that, that, that parameter is easy, but the difficult thing is basically to measure the ETI. What does the Ministry of Finance do? They basically use a parameter 0.1. It's a little lower, uh, but they use basically a parameter around 0.1. That implies 60%. If this elasticity is 0.2, oh, it's 120%. We are above the lever rate of this particular tax instrument. If it's 0 0.05, then it's only 30%. So this elasticity is going to be really key for computing anything inside the, the uh, Ministry of Finance when they compute different forms or advise policymakers. Now, um, what about the literature? Well, we have a literature trying to estimate the ETI, and you have different types of methods, but the most sort of uh, used uh, approach in the academic literature is basically a difference in different type setting. So think about a treatment group up here. That's those people who pay the top tax rate. Then you have a control group. That's people just below the threshold do not pay the top tax rate. And you look at their income over time. And what is interesting, ha, in 2010, for example, Denmark reduced the top tax rate. So here there was a reduction in the rate. So now you could say, ah, in a way to try to measure it basically in this setting is to see, well, these two curves seem very parallel, right? So what you're basically are doing in a difference in different setting, you move this curve up here and say, this seems to be a good counterfactual. We have a common trend. And now we're going to say, well, if we did not have this reform, then these guys up here paying the high top tax rate, they would be here instead. So this is basically saying that the difference between these two curves is measuring the effect of reducing the, rate, top, the top tax rate for all these individuals. So that's the approach done, try to measuring it. And I should say it's basically much more sophisticated because there's so many econometric problems that you're facing when it's just a, not an ordinary different diff, but it's the intuition for the basic variation 
that is creating this elasticity. Look at the literature. It's, uh, there's a survey paper came out in 2012 for the US on all the empirical evidence, basically saying all the evidence lies between 0.12 and 0.4 for this crucial elasticity with a midpoint estimate of 0.25. In Denmark, we have a paper by Henrik Kleven, Esben Schult, published in American Economic Journal of Economic Policy, saying where they basically use all the Danish data as good as they can and get different, depending on specification, time periods, and so on, unless this is lying in the range 0.05 to 0.2. Now, I worked in this area myself also. So um, I have a paper that came out here in AJ Paul also, we're basically saying, ah, you know, this literature, we may actually overestimate the ETI when you do some of the more simple estimations that are often done. Why is that? Well, we had there's a new data source in Denmark where I got access to all Danes, their monthly payment. Okay? So it's basically your paycheck each month for all the population. What I could see was in 2010, the tax rate was reduced on the, on the top. And what happened was basically when you look at people's uh, pay in December, then funny enough, it goes down. Whoops. Oh, but then it turns up in January. And a much lower tax rate, of course, right? And, you know, we sort of thought that maybe that effect is going on, but it's actually going on to a big surprise, much, much bigger effect than you would ever think. What does that imply when I'm sort of evaluating this reform? Then I could say, okay, before reform, income is low. After reform, income is high. So this reform has a huge effect. But of course, it's just a temporary effect. It's just people who are basically done tax avoidance, just a one-time shifting effect. No real effect of this reform, right? But then I have another paper saying, oh, you actually underestimate the EGI. Now, why is that? Well, the thing is that, that this uh, method is very bad at detecting certain effects that you might think of important. If you reduce the tax, then I may say, do I want to drive a long distance to a new job? This new job pays a lot of more salary, but I have to drive a lot, okay? But I get a paid job. Or do you say, do I want to shift to this company? It's a small company, they pay my, my, my much higher salary, but you know there's a risk. Small companies, just new companies, gone, right? So there's a risk that you're gonna lose that job. So you're gonna say, well, are you gonna go for it? If the tax is lower, then the big pay rise is gonna matter much more. So these type of behavioral effects the standard method cannot really detect it. So what we did in this paper, we built it up a structural model, estimated a structural model, and basically the pitch of this paper was to say, well, actually we miss these tough responses and they're potentially very important. We got much higher elasticities. Okay, that was an academic paper, Journal of Public Economics, right? But what then happened was I was caught up by the journalist. They before going on summer day holiday and said, I don't know why, but he knew about this paper from someone, right? And he said, hey, you got these high elasticities. That's much higher than the Minister of Finance. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. I don't see that, you know, that, that, that should change anything. Uh, and uh, yeah, we talked a little back and forth. Then I went on summer holiday, and the same day I went on summer holiday, I went on the front page of this newspaper. Inside the newspaper, there's a picture of Minister of Finance and his civil servant, and it's basically saying that this guy has the wrong people hired because they don't know what is going on. They are completely behind. <laughs> Elasticities are much, much higher than you should expect. Uh, and, you know, they're completely off the elasticities that they're using. Okay, so, so when I got back from summer holidays, there was a lot of, uh, who, oh, a lot of things going on. It's full of newspapers going on. <laughs> Now, what happened then in the end of the thing? The Danish parliament invited, they made a hearing and invited me inside the Danish parliament, basically to get this thing out, what was right and what was wrong. Now, this is a brilliant opportunity. You get inside the parliament, you can tell the politician, hey, I got this study, it has a new elasticity, you should use them. Then I have direct policy impact, right? Brilliant, but I didn't do that. Instead, I said <laughs> the following, hold on, hold on, hold on, think about Think about you cannot see this picture, and you're just staring at this small part of the picture, and you're going to say, what color is that picture, right? And you say, oh, it's red, and you're going to stand very close by and say, hey, this picture is definitely red, right? <laughs> and this is a beautiful picture of Picasso, right? And it's definitely not a red picture. So the thing is, it's a little like with the empirical evidence here. You should not just take this study, because this study had a special academic point, but 
the, the identification of elasticity was not very strong in this structural model that we were doing. So my point was just to say the right way to do this is basically to look at all the empirical evidence with a, you know, a qualified group of people looking at the evidence and then try to find out what are the right elasticities based on all the evidence. Note what is a shame here is afterwards we are never going to say that this particular paper changed the elasticities in Copenhagen, right? That's not going to happen. But what happened in practice was actually that now we have a ministerial working group in Denmark headed by the Ministry of Finance, and they're basically going go through the whole empirical foundation behind this ETI measure. They have appointed an advisory board of five academics, including myself, and the idea is basically to say, okay, let's try to find out what is the right elasticity to use, and they're gonna base it on all the empirical evidence. So in that sense, I think the empirical evidence on this area is super important because if they're going to change the elasticity, it's going to have huge impact in all their uh, cost-benefit analysis and all their calculation for redistribution of taxation. Uh, but in the end, you're not, never going to point to one study say, oh, this study changed things. Okay. So finally, if I have time, let me just finally uh, say additional words on why admin data is so crucial for researchers. First. If you look at Denmark, the Danish ministers, ministries, they're actually using admin data to make policy analysis. It's called evidence-based policy advice. And I think this is really, really good. They do that inside the Danish ministries. They try to see, okay, what kind of data do we have to make informed choices and give reports to the politicians. This in itself is basically a proof of concept that admin data is important, has very important information for society. If it's important for policy making up here, right? Now second, should researchers have access? Well, if these guys have access, then of course we should have access, right? Because then you need independent researchers to basically to control policy making. It's basically important for a democracy. You cannot have it's only the policy makers who have access to the data and nobody else. You need independent researchers who have the independence to also have it. Next, researchers actually provide this new important evidence. It's kind of difficult just to point to one study, but I'll give you an example of I think it's important what is going on inside the ministries here that they use, actually in practice, they do use this work. Researchers teach the next generation of these civil servants, these policymakers inside the ministries. For example, you know, I myself and my, my colleagues and department are often supervising econ students who are doing a BA, master thesis, they sit inside the ministries and they have access to the data. And then they can do the, uh, the BA thesis or master thesis, which is very, very nice to get basically a good education in this way. And finally, let me mention that in Denmark we have what is called the Economic Policy Research uh, Network, which is headed by myself, which is consisting of, of uh, applied uh, research group doing uh, policy relevant work, and then the different uh, economic ministries, also the Danish Central Bank. And the idea is basically to foster this exchange of knowledge for people doing empirical work with admin data. So we present our work, which is applied, and they present policy analysis that they're doing, and then we are saying, oh, God, man. You know, you should have rid of this great data. You have done so bad in terms of method, right? But you should just do that, then you could do it much better. And I think this is actually a very nice forum where you get, you know, this uh, indirect impact on, on policy, but you do not have this direct impact that you often are sort of uh, looking for. Thank you so much.